there. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming tonight. Yes. Let's go ahead. Sorry we're starting late, but we had a busy work session. And let's see. Let me switch screens here. All right. Well, welcome to the April 22nd, 2019 Tualatin City Council meeting. Tonight we'll start off in our customary way with our birthday counselor, Councillor Grimes, doing the Pledge of Allegiance. So just a little bit of uh, agenda management. The folks here from the Ice Age Foundation, what we're gonna do is TVFNR is not here tonight. So we're gonna slide you into their slot. Uh, so you'll be going up after our two proclamations. So be prepared in a few minutes. <laughs> and rather than, uh, gives you a little bit more time to discuss what you wanna say tonight, rather than doing during uh, citizen comment. All right, so first item on our agenda tonight is our National Police Week proclamation. Um, so Captain Turner is here. I think this is your first meeting, isn't it, to be here? Yeah. Well, welcome. <laughs> so have you anything to say about National Police Week? <laughs> right. Especially with the happenings last week. Was it last week, the officer down south? It's just a shame. and. Just nuts how people don't think twice about taking police officers' lives is just incomprehensible for me. Councillor Davis. Um, so I um, have the pleasure of getting to do um, a lot of good work with um, our department. We have an outstanding police department, um, and we uh, support them also with an independent nonprofit um, called the Twilton Community Police Foundation. If you haven't heard of us, please take a look at uh, TUCPF.org. It's a great group. Um, last week was um, emergency um, 911 uh, communicators week last week, and I'm not sure that we got to read something for them. So um, keep your 911 operators in mind as well. But today is all about National Police Week. And so this is our proclamation. Proclamation declaring the week of May 12 through 18, 2019 is National Police Week in the city of Tualatin. Whereas the Congress of the United States of America has designated the week of May 12 through 18, 2019 to be dedicated as National Police Week and May 15th of each year to be National Police Memorial Day in honor of the federal, state, and municipal officers who have been killed or disabled in the line of duty. And whereas is, <clears throat> sorry, I have a sore throat today. Whereas it is known that on average, one law enforcement officer is killed in the line of duty somewhere in the United States every 58 hours. Since the first known line of duty death in 1791, more than 21,000 US law enforcement officers have made the ultimate sacrifice. And whereas law enforcement officers, including Tualatin police officers, are our guardians of life and property and defenders of the individual rights of freedom. And whereas, the city of Tualatin is proud of our law enforcement officers and wish to recognize their commitment to the public safety profession. And whereas the Tualatin Police Department and officers provide the highest quality services and are committed to the highest professional standards, working in partnership with our community to meet the challenges of reducing crime, creating a safe environment, and re improving our quality of life. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the city of Tualatin designates the week of May 12 through 18, 2019 as Police Memorial Week in the city of Tualatin to call attention to Tualatin police officers for the outstanding service they provide to our community. The city council also calls upon our residents and businesses to express their thanks to the men and women who make it possible for us to leave our homes and family in safety each day and return to our homes knowing they are protected by men and women willing to sacrifice their lives if necessary to guard our loved ones, property, and government against all who would violate the law. Introduced and adopted this 22nd day of April 2019. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do and putting it out there every single day. If you ever have had a chance to do a ride along, and if you haven't done it, 
try to do it because you will learn some things that you just have no idea what what our officers go through every day it is unreal thank you thank you all right next up is public service recognition week proclamation done by councillor brooks uh good evening i as a newly elected um councillor I want to say one of the best parts of my position is getting to meet all of our city employees and the public servants that work in for our city. Um, I, people are dedicated. We have a lot of really good reflection from the community about the good service that they receive from our city. And the more that I get to know each and every one of them the more that um, I appreciate them so it really is an honor to work alongside with our city and I'm gonna put my light on okay here's the proclamation <laughs> um, declaring the week of May 5th through May 11th 2019 as public service recognition week in honor of the public employees of the city of Tualatin Whereas public service is an honorable calling that involves a wide variety of challenging and rewarding professions, including providing recreational services, maintaining public safety, improving transportation, protecting our environment, and performing administrative and management activities which are essential to efficient and effective operation of government. And whereas Tualatin City's employees contribute significantly to the quality of life for the Tualatin community with their commitment to excellence, high ethical standards, and diversity of skills. And whereas excellence in the delivery of public service keeps Tualatin strong, prosperous, and a wonderful place in which to live, work, play, visit, and volunteer, and whereas this commemoration provides an opportunity to express our appreciation for the many contributions public employees make in, to our daily lives. Now, therefore, it is proclaimed by the Tualatin City Council that the week of May 5th through the 11th, 2019, be Public Service Recognition Week in the city of Tualatin, and the council encourages the entire community to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of public employees introduced and adopted today all right, thank you all right so item number b3 uh, as i mentioned before Tualatin valley fire and rescue uh cannot make it tonight so i'm going to ask the ice age foundation folks to come on up forward to the table and speak in lieu of the firefighters today <laughs> so i've got three of you scott yvonne yep. and Sylvia and Rick Thompson. Right. They're All a right. team. All right. Come on up. I guess I'll start. Uh, I'm Scott Burns. I'm a geology professor at Portland State. I've been teaching 49 years around the world, the last 29 years at Portland State, but I have lived in Tualatin for the last 29 years and wrote a book uh, on the Missoula floods. We are at the crossroads of the Missoula floods, these great Ice Age floods that came through here and then went back out into the Willamette River between 15 and 18,000 years ago. And our group here uh, uh, is more informational. We would like to develop a visitor center here, part of the Ice Age Flood Trail. It's our newest national park that we have got that is found uh, uh, all the way from here all the way up to Missoula, Montana. The scheme is that there will be 18 visitor centers all the way from Astoria all the way up to Missoula, Montana highlighting this is a new style of national park instead of going to a mountain or a gorge you follow a geological con conference uh, or, or concept as you go through we want to be the visitor center for portland the whole portland area uh, and rick is the president of our ice age flood uh, chapter that is here in uh, tualatin and he'll mention a little bit in a second so we have uh, now a 501c3 to raise money for this 
Uh, and the concept is that we will have a visitor center that will emphasize four different things. Number one, the whole concept of the Ice Age floods in the Pacific Northwest. Two, locally, how did the whole Portland area get affected? Number three, Ice Age flood mammals. We have Tutu Tuala, our, uh, our mastodon that is at the library right now. Uh, and we have a collection that is growing and growing. And then number four, Native Americans and how they played in the early times here in this area. Uh, this will be an outreach to students. We, I hope that every uh, a grade school kid will get a chance to come through here and learn about this incredible natural history event that occurred in the past. I still remember growing up in Beaverton, going to a country grade school, going to see uh, uh, Shampooig, where our state started, and then John McLaughlin House. Still in my mind, and we want every kid to do that. Secondly, tourism. Bring people into this area, to, and they're going to be people that are going to be doing the whole trip from one end to the other. Right now, the concept is we're going to be at the library. And Jerry Ann, who's back here, has been very, very helpful uh, with us. That's where Tutu Tuala is, but we're going to be outgrowing that very soon. We are raising money right now to have a video uh, that will, anytime you go to a visitor's uh, center for any of the national parks, you start with a vid video, uh, and that will be our beginning. Eventually, we'll morph into a bigger facility. We will raise money for that, and it's exciting. So that's what I really wanted to mention today. Today is Earth Day for geologists. It is an exciting time. 49 years ago, I was on the organizational committee with Dennis Hayes at Stanford University. This started it. Next year is going to be the 50th. It's an apropos time to talk about the Ice Age Flood Visitor Center here. So I'm going to pass it over to Yvonne, uh, who I think all of you know, and then she will then pass it over to Rick, and, and Sylvia will be passing some things to you. Well, I think all of you know me. I uh, was the first city manager and municipal judge when this town started to grow. Um, I also, when I was just in high school, I typed the thesis for the man who dug up the uh, the uh, toilet and tutu toilet, and you call it, the mastodon. When I was a city manager, then in uh, '74, I was with uh, engineers with the city and walked out of Portland State cafeteria and there were the bones of the toilet and mastodon in a display case marked tigered mastodon so you can imagine what a toilet and city manager felt like I called him up and said just change the sign with you and they said we don't have any room do you want the bones we weren't very sophisticated back then but for some reason I took them <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Public Works stored them for years and years and had a, a mark on the, on the box that said, do not touch, this is Yvonne's skeleton in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, years later, I left the city. This was the last building I financed and went to work for the governor's office and held a national position. All the time, I was looking around at uh, different cities and I felt like Tualatin was probably the best of all of them. So I've been donating my, uh, my time to making this place a little better. We now have nine different bones of nine prehistoric animals in the uh, city library, all uh, very close to the Tualatin River with the, uh, with the latest rediscovery that I found in U of O was uh, Chairman Andy Dykes, four prehistoric bones that he and his dad dug up when he was 14 years old. So, but we've run out of room. Jerry and uh, Paul were just excellent helpers for us, and we, if we're going to do anything, we need to do it for fast. This uh, report was done in 2010 with a grant from uh, Washington County Visitors Association, done by Bill Baker of Total Destination Management and a Tualatin City resident. It tells us how to go about it, and we've been doing it piece by piece, but now it, it's time to form a foundation and get a building and get a place for the future. And, and just before we pass it on, uh, we want to thank Linda Moholt, uh, who was it, got us the um, 501c3, and Councilor Robert Kellogg, who was the lawyer who did all the work. So thank you to both of yes. you. So now, uh, Rick. Okay. I have some slides I want to show you real quick. And you're going to pass some things out? Don't have a lot to do with what I'm saying, so maybe you can just watch. Let me see how to get this here. Okay. Where did the 
beginning. As Scott said, I'm Rick Thompson, uh, president of the, the Lower Columbia chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute, which is an educational organization to make people aware of the effects of the Ice Age floods, especially in this area. We do it here in Tualatin by holding monthly meetings in cooperation with the Historical Society. What you are being, well, one of the things you're being, the, I see you're getting them in, in the opposite order of what I was thinking, but that's okay. <laughs> we, we have 11 chapters in four different states. Uh, and then, and this, this is the, the brochure for the Ice Age Floods Institute. Inside, it shows a map of the route. In 2009, the Ice, Ice Age Floods National Geologic Trail was signed into legislation, and uh, it will have, uh, as Scott said, 18 visitor centers. It will have hubs and uh, main routes and spurs, and Tualatin has been designated as a hub on that National Geologic Trail. Uh, okay, last year, our chapter produced this brochure, which it actually took m multiple years to, to finally put together. Um, it features the, the, all the things within the Lower Columbia area, or not all of them, but the main things that are in the Lower Columbia area that uh, were affected by these floods. The brochure is distributed through the Historical Society, the library, City Hall, and wherever I go to give talks at uh, history nights, uh, local uh, meetings of people, and at visitor places like uh, Vista House in the Columbia River Gorge. So a lot of people are being attracted to this area with uh, the information we're giving out. Now the, the brochure, do you have the other? Drive oh, guide. oh, okay, no, the, the drive guide. The drive guide is something that Scott and I produced last year. We gave uh, the brochure and the drive guide to all the participants on a field trip for the entire Ice Age Floods Institute. So we had them all come to Tualatin to see what is happening here and how, one, how, effect, how the floods affected this area, but also, what Tualatin is doing to, to m let people know about it. People were amazed. They didn't uh, have any idea that either the floods actually got down here and did anything, or that a small town like Tualatin could make a big thing out of it. We've now been hearing from other cities and other chapters wanting to replicate what Tualatin is doing. Yeah. So Tualatin now actually is known as an Ice Age destination. And we're hoping that the city council can uh, add to what we're already doing to bring in tourism, which we're already seeing. So we're hoping that you can support these continuing efforts. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't, can't talk and think at the same time. Uh, just let me go through these real quick. These are what we see in this area. And this is the, the pictures that first got the uh, National Park Service interested in Tualatin. And then the last is <coughs> Niver Greenway, which isn't quite in Tualatin, but it's part of the, the floods effect that we have in this area. It is Tualatin? Oh, okay, I take it back. It is in Tualatin. Yvonne would know. Oh, and then the, <laughs> she would. And the, the Nyberg Greenway wetland is right over here. Did I cover that already? Yeah. Yep. Oh. yep. Okay, well, thank you very much. So we just thank you very for your time. We're excited about what we are doing. We are doing something very special for the city of Tualatin in our region, and it's something educational, also tourism uh, related, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh. Councilor Keller? Uh, First, thank you for the presentation. I've been intrigued by this idea since Linda approached me about doing the foundation. Um, and I want to reiterate something I mentioned last Monday at our budget work session about the tourism money and what we can do to appropriate it. And I, for one, fully support the idea of putting some city money towards this visitor center. I think it's a tremendous opportunity to bring tourism to Tualatin, and none of it would have been possible without your work. So thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right, so item B4, a new employee introduction. Don Hudson will be introducing a new employee. Mayor and Council, my name is Don Hudson. I'm the Assistant City Manager here, and it is my pleasure this evening to introduce, introduce Rocio Vargas, who is our newest municipal court clerk, reporting to Courtney Kammerer. She's been with us for a couple months now? Uh, just about. Just about two months, and it's been a pleasure having her. She's jumped right in. She came to us from the city of Newburgh, where she was a court clerk with the city, so she had a lot of uh, knowledge coming to us in the court clerk oper or the municipal court operations, as well as the software we use. And she has just, again, just jumped right in and been a great addition to our team. In her responsibility, she handles all the stuff related to the court, answering questions, dealing with people when they come to the counter, and assisting people when they come to the arraignments and trials. In her spare time, she likes to bake, and we're looking forward to some of those <laughs> things that she might bring in. Did we tell that to you already? No, okay. <laughs> well, now you know. No, no. Uh, she likes <laughs> photography oh, cool. and editing photos. So it, she's going to be hopefully be able to take some of the photos of me and maybe make them look a little, a little bit better. Uh, they'll be quite the challenge for you, but good luck. <laughs> in nice weather, she likes to hike, and she loves to travel. And back in her college days, she did a college service project in Peru. Oh, wow. So we're looking forward to hearing more about that in the future. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Rocio Vargas. Well, welcome, Rocio. It's, Thank you. We're glad to have you. Our traffic court is very busy, and I know Don it was, needed the help. And in my mind, it's nice and once in a while to get a, you know, we had a few employees get hired by Newburgh, so now it's payback. <laughs> now, you know, we got one, one of Newburgh's people, so very much welcome to, to Walton, and come on up and we'll introduce ourselves. We have a second employee introduction, uh, Tanya Williams, when you've seen Teresa. Good evening, Mayor and Council. You have to forgive me, I have a little bit of a cold, but um, tonight we are introducing Teresa Wegscheid. She is the new office coordinator for the administration department. So when you stop by the city manager's office, you'll see her smiling, <laughs> lovely face there to greet you. Um, she started just a week ago, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. two I'm weeks ago. So time. she, yeah, she's starting her third week. So um, she has um, jumped right in and is mm -hmm. doing a great job. She um, supports the city manager's office as well as human resources. Um, she oversees all the office management um, responsibilities, including records management, supporting city council meetings. Um, she joins us from most recently at a um, real estate firm, and before that, she worked um, for Mojave County in Arizona. She has mm -hmm. over 15 years of experience working in um, office management. Um, in Arizona, she worked for the county assessor's office, so she has a lot of experience working um, with the public and answering questions and um, being a public servant. So we're really excited to have Teresa join us and welcome her to Tualatin. Well, thank you for coming. I mean, uh, it's great to have you here. I think between uh, the busy schedule Sherilyn has and all the activities going on in HR and we'll keep you busy, mm -hmm. believe us. <laughs> and the, they have everything going on in Tualatin, as you know, we're a growing city. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you'll ever be bored and you'll, uh, you'll enjoy working at the city. Most you know, we hear back constantly that Employees love working for Tualatin, and the public appreciates Tualatin employees. So welcome aboard. Thank you. Come on up. All right, so our final new employee introduction tonight is from Jerry Ann Thompson in the library, introducing David.
Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I'm Jerry Ann Thompson, the Library Director, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to David Abbey, who is our new Access Services Supervisor. In that position, he oversees circulation, which is in checking in, checking out the books, as well as technical services, which is where they catalog and process all the materials to make them available for users throughout the county. Um, David's background includes several years working as a manager in the moving, storage, transportation, and logistics industries, and he has a master's in business administration, so he's able to help us in some pretty interesting ways. Um, <clears throat> he was in the military for a while and was a veteran in the first Gulf War. After leaving the military, he and his wife settled in Oregon, and they've been part of the Tualatin community for 22 years. Oh, wow. Both his daughter and son graduated from Tualatin High School, and his daughter actually worked for the library when she was in high school as a page. <laughs> David's work in libraries actually began as a volunteer here in Tualatin. Mm. He was a, a volunteer at the library and also served on the library advisory committee. We first hired him about six years ago as a senior library assistant. He then worked at, as the circulation supervisor at Tigard Public Library and circulation supervisor at Beaverton Library before we hired him back. When he's not working, his favorite thing to do is to walk the paths around Tualatin High School with his wife and his two golden retriever puppies. And David says he's thrilled to have the opportunity to once again work and contribute in the community where he lives and to be in the role of Access Services Supervisor. Wow. Welcome back. Well, thank you. It's kind of nice to be, you know, live and work in the same town. Jeez, that, that's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> might be able to bike or walk to work. And it's, it's a, um, this says a lot that you came back to the library. You know how popular library is here uh, so you know the amount of work you're gonna have but you know folks love our library you know that and um, lots of events at the library that are very well attended um, and I appreciate you coming back to the city it's Thanks. gonna be uh, Jerry Ann's a great person to work for I think you're gonna have a great time again Thank you. I'm glad to be back all right <laughs> So you're Beaverton before this? Yes. Good. <laughs> we still went for Beaverton too. <laughs> That's the real victory. That's the victory. Oh, I do. Oh, I do. Yeah, go back and forth. All right. Okay, so now on to item C. Item C on the agenda is public comments, which is an opportunity for anyone in the uh, council chambers to address the council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone here who would like to address the council, this would be an appropriate time. I have right now two people signed up, but you don't have to be signed up to address the council. So I'll start with uh, Anthony Stewart. All right. <laughs> okay. Can I have the second person joining me? It's on the oh, yeah, sure. topic. Just All right. And just, just state your name for the record, and you don't have to say where you live anymore. Sure. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to know. <laughs> well, we do. I mean, the city, but not the street address. Right. Yeah. The wife yeah. likes flowers. Um, <laughs> my name is Anthony Stewart. I'm a representative counsel for Western Oregon Dispensary, a locally owned uh, by President Sherry Rawson a group of adult, life, adult use uh, cannabis uh, production and retail facilities. Today, uh, I wanted to formally introduce... Western Oregon. We've worked with the planning team for the past about a year and a half discussing the status quo for regulations here in the city as it relates to adult use um, cannabis or what we call rec what some call recreational cannabis regulations in the city. Um, as some of you may know, in 2015, Tualatin enacted uh, a series of regulations that was uh, ahead of the eventual opening up of the adult use market, and there has not been a significant return to that since 2015, despite a lot of regulatory, statutory, and policy updates at the state level, the federal level, and in certain locations. Uh, things that uh, uniquely impact local jurisdictions. So we wanted to bring this to your attention, let you know it's something that we're still really excited to work with the uh, county staff for. We have a few proposed areas that I think um, we'd like to draw your attention to kind of hone in on exactly where we think a few changes could be made to improve the development opportunity now that the entire state has had the opportunity to learn and adjust to what it means to be in this business. Um, the first would be a revisiting of the buffer zones. Um, 
state law is almost silent. It talks about very limited things um, that are required, the first of which is you can't locate a facility uh, more than a certain amount of distance, 2,000 foot from another, and um, the, uh, the only other thing that's required by state law is more than 1,000 foot from a school, unless there's a ravine or some other geographic or physical barrier between the two, then it's 500. Other than that, it's just open to the city's discretion for reasonable time, place, and manner. Um, because of the climate and the response to the informal survey that the City Council had done in 2015, it was understandable that the city was a little tentative as to uh, opening up, didn't want to look like Barber Boulevard by way of example, uh, the facility and all these um, just everywhere, visible everywhere. As we've moved forward, it's obvious now that the city of Tualatin has no licenses and so we believe it's a little bit overly restrictive and a few different modifications on the zoning and the buffering requirements are going to be helpful. Uh, the zoning changes that we think would be helpful is to recognize the nuance between the different licenses. I mean, to be looking at them the whole time. The nuances between the licensee types. When this was originally reviewed in 2015, uh, all of the marijuana facilities, whether it is a production facility, processing, wholesaler, retailer, they were all given the exact same application. At the time, we were still as a state trying to understand what it. Oh, sorry. In, in conclusion, the zoning could be expanded to commercial. Um, I have a few other suggestions. I will be following up in writing to each of the counselors as well as with the planning staff. But this is Ms. Sherry Ralston who will give you the, the friendlier face of Western Oregon. So as uh, Anthony said, I'm the owner of Western Oregon Dispensary. We have three um, marijuana dispensaries in the outline area and a fourth coming um, in the fall. And so I just wanted to come and introduce myself to you and just share um, you know, my experience with running these stores, um, and we just run them quietly and efficiently. We work well with the cities. We have good relationships with the cities, and we turn in significant tax dollars to those cities, um, none of which the city of Tualatin is collecting at this time. So um, we'll be putting in um, some further information to you folks just to talk to you a little bit more about some firmer numbers of what we're doing with other cities just to give you a little bit of a, an input of what um, is available out there if things were to change uh, in a way where we could actually have a location that we could have a dispensary in the city of Tualatin and then just continue to talk to you a little bit further about any questions that you might have or um, concerns so thank you okay. thank you Appreciate you, all. Okay. Appreciate you all very much. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Do you have anyone else for citizen comment? Don't have to be signed up. All right. So moving on to item D, consent agenda. The items in section D are considered routine and will be adopted by one motion unless someone on the council would like one of them removed and heard separately later tonight. The consent agenda tonight consists of item D1, consideration of approval of the minutes for the work session of March 25th, 2019, and the regular meeting of April 8th, 2019. Would anyone like an item removed from consent tonight and heard separately? Motion to adopt the consent agenda is read. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as read. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes. All right. Next up. Our CERT annual update from Kathy Holland. <laughs> yep. I guess Charlie will sub. We'll kick it off. Oh, here she comes. Oh, no, there she is. <laughs> there she is. I'm doing a little business out yeah. in the lobby. <laughs> Good evening. You know, we have to fix those zoning. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, good evening. I'm Kathy Holland. I'm a resident of Tualatin and president of the Tualatin Community Emergency Response Team. And sitting here to my right, my right hand, is Charlie Benson, who is also, he's our vice president. And he's representing the other board members, many of their board members, because when we talk about a team accomplishment, there are nine people on our board and every one of them lifts very heavy weight. Brian Font is gonna be helping with the presentation. He is our uh, members, membership director, <clears throat> excuse me, 
That was the most aerobics I've had in a while. <laughs> All right, well, tonight we're going to be going over our accomplishments. This is the third report we've made to the city council. For the new council members, uh, we were started in no, our first class graduated in October 2016. Tualatin was very late to the CERT program, but I think we're all very proud of how much we've accomplished in a short period of time, which we could not have done without the team effort of the volunteers and support from Clay Reynolds in the city's operations department. He has been outstanding and the now retired Kathy Cotts. They have been fantastic and have been real partners. We're proud of our team effort. We're proud of our board members, which include radio, ham radio specialists, and ARIES, which is the emergency radio system. It's amateur radio emergency system. Uh, we also have Barbara Bracken, who was here a couple weeks ago, and I think she took you to school on Neighborhood Ready. Thank you very much. I'll talk more about how helpful your letters have been. Uh, our commitment is connection is protection. It's in all of our material. We borrowed the phrase from another emergency neighborhood planning program, but it is exactly what we believe. The more connected we are, the more protected we are. Uh, in this third year, we've had, we fin just finished up our sixth basic training class. We now have 127 active resident members and 17 business members. The business members, the cost of training them was done by their company, but we provided the instructions and we certified them. And they are available to us in a crisis depending or some sort of catastrophic emergency, depending on whatever situation they're in. Uh, we're we are continuing meeting every month with training meetings. And uh, of course, Barbara took you to school on Tualatin Ready. And then we have also launched a members only website, which is password protected. That way we can protect the confidential information about our members. It also helps us with our communication and volunteer management. Charlie and I have learned that it's good to ask people who know what they're doing to do stuff that we need doing. Brian is a database manager and web designer, and he constructed this uh, members-only website. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Councillor Kellogg, who has been very helpful to us and is a team member. Although we don't see you as much as we <laughs> want, we know why you're busy. <laughs> so we do have a requirement for activity. We have 22 inactive members who aren't able to meet our activity requirement. Uh, part of our outreach includes ham training, not just for our CERT members, but we want everybody, including all of you, to have a ham license and a ham radio. It is the backup preference for emergency management. When Puerto Rico went down, and parts of it are still down, ham radio is the only way they could communicate for months. So depending on what disaster you model, you might find it helpful to have one yourself and we will train you for free. And if you are willing to join our team, we'll even lend you a city five watt radio. So the, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, we've added more trainers. Uh, we started out being trained by Tigert. We then got uh, a trainer who went through Train the Trainer, that's Stan Sutton, who is now in charge of our training and one of our board members. We're going to have, it says five there, we've trained five. Uh, next weekend, 
uh, three more go through that training, and then we had a person transfer. So we now have six trainers. So as we offer training to businesses and other places, we're going to have more people to train. And of course, Barbara's training people for the neighborhood outreach. Training is our middle name. Uh, go ahead, go to the next one. We've provided assistance to the city as they've asked. I picked my favorite project, which was the fun run, where a certain attorney was dressed in an interesting way. <laughs> yes, I, I, I liked it. Uh, we provided communication support uh, for the zombies and others that were involved in the kids' fun run. But we also uh, met with uh, the emergency water planning group and provided feedback to them. Um, we've also uh, provided uh, parking lot patrols for the Punkin Regatta. And we look forward to doing as much as the city asks us to do. Um, we're just ready to um, step up. Juanita Pohl offers educational classes on emergency preparedness. We've been doing those. In fact, I just did one last week. Uh, what am I going to next slide? Uh, after the material in your packet, you actually have a digital copy of the workbook so that if you wanted to print it out or send it to someone, it's in your packet. I understand you all have hard copies. Next one. This is the home page of a couple of weeks ago, my home page of our members only website. Do you want to go ahead? And, sure. and we're going to have Brian do a two and a half minute presentation on this. And hopefully we can get it all to work. This is the dashboard that uh, Kathy was talking about. It's what people see when they Here, first you have, in. I can't hear you in the back. Unless, you, unless you're Scott Burns, then you can hear <laughs> Or maybe Kathy, she gets heard pretty well. <laughs> Scott Burns and I, same school of talking. Uh, everything's centered around our um, family of volunteers. When you log in, you get to see how uh, you belong to the different groups. We have 126 right now and one who is waiting to get her final certificate. If we click on that, we get a list of everybody's information. And this is one of the reasons we password protect the site. We treat everybody's privacy uh, as carefully as we can remind everybody that um, we're all in the same boat, but we need to share this information uh, so that we can work together. Clicking on uh, any one of these gives a little bit more information about each person, a bio, a photo, their personal contact information, how to reach them by ham radio uh, if uh, we're doing that. And then we have different lists that are broken up different ways. These are our recent graduates. And if we click a view map icon, we can see where throughout the city everybody is located. And that includes the CIO map and our base report locations. So this group reports here first, and if this, if Byram is in session, they would report to this park. Can you drill down so uh, we can see, oh, you just have Byram on there for which can you do all of the members yes yeah because i'd like you to show the radio map because we're going to be talking about something charlie's involved in with radios these are all active cert members if we switch over to the ham radio list these are all of our licensed cert members who have radio licenses and where they're located throughout Twalton. So, the way amateur radio works is that a very low power radio, 5 watts, 9 watts, 25 watts, can talk through repeaters all over the world. But if the repeaters go down, the way hams communicate is ham to ham. So we're in the process of setting up communication hubs, which is what Charlie's in charge of, and the, by CIO, and those would be places where people could go 
and say, I want to get a message to Seattle. Do you want to talk about that, Charlie? Yeah, so there's, uh, we're, we're working on the hub to basically handle two different types of communication. Internal communication whereby uh, CERT members can be uh, directed in the field. We can get information from either the Tualatin Emergency Operations Center or the, the uh, Washington County Emergency Operations Center. Uh, and so we use CERT members and ham radio operators to man both, both phases of this. The internal part, one, to make sure that our members are safe and we have uh, an adequate response to the areas that we need. And also to be able to provide accurate and timely information to the public instead of the Facebook. Well, the, second, the, the, <laughs> sec the second phase of that is how, do, how does the community then be able to get information and get information outside the affected area? And so that's the external part of it, and that will be done using ham operators as relays. So we have a central point where people in each CIO can then come, give their message so that their loved ones outside the affected area will know, and then utilizing not only the CERT ham radio network, but also the other hams that are located throughout Tualatin in the state and then in Idaho and wherever, we can then relay messages to wherever they need to go. Uh, but we become a central processing point for those members of the community as a place where they can come get information and then also be able to send out information. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we're <clears throat> our goal is a resilient community. A woman broke down in tears. You want to go back to the slide presentation. A woman broke down in tears at one of our community meetings when she talked about a neighborhood that happened to be in the Midwest where they had a very tight community response. They had a lot of tornadoes, their version of earthquakes. And there was a part of the community that was, bro was uh, cut off from first responders for three or four days. When the first responders went in, instead of finding a place in chaos, they found the streets were cleared, the people who had lost homes were rehoused by their neighbors, the people were having a barbecue. That is a resilient community. And that's what we're trying to plan for here with your help. Uh, now I'm going to talk about money. Uh, you guys have, we have a modest budget of $8,000 a year, which we use for training and for um, uh, equipment for our 50 new members that we equip a year. We are asking and have asked through Clay for another $3,000 for next year just to cover some printing expense and other expense related to Tualatin Ready. We see that as a single cost. For your $8,000, you're getting hundreds and hundreds of hours of professionals where we're trying to match up the accountants with accounting, the data ma managers with <laughs> data management. Our, uh, we have physicians, we have nurses, we have um, plumbers. We need more plumbers. If there's <laughs> plumbers watching this show, <laughs> please volunteer for CERT. We can use more plumbers. Uh, we're we're homemakers, child care specialists. We're really trying to gear up so that our program gives people the kind of security that that neighborhood in the Midwest felt after a tornado. Now, our problem is that we don't know when this is going to happen. I promised you two years ago that it wouldn't happen for three years. So I still got 12 months on my promise. And I'm hoping that I'm right. We don't know whether we have two years or five years or 50 years. And all of us as taxpayers do not want to see the city waste money, where size city we are, to have a lot of staff and overhead waiting for an event that may never happen. That's not our request. What we're trying to do is be as frugal as possible. We're frugal, aren't we, Charlie? Yes. Yeah. 
we're frugal. We're very careful with taxpayer money, and we hope that uh, the city will see fit to uh, approve that. The other thing that we, there are four other things on our list. The thank you letters, the initial ones that you did, Barbara will be sending you a list periodically to the manager's office of additional letters. Barbara has asked me to ask you, and I think she might have asked you, to find someone on your street to host your meeting. We'd like to say, now I know uh, the mayor has had Map Your Neighborhood for your street back in the day. We but talked about it, yeah. Yeah, but it's been a while. Yeah. Um, we'd like to do your neighborhoods. If nothing else, you'd have a chance to give us feedback. Maybe you don't have time to host it, but perhaps you can recommend someone on your street. And that includes a city manager who appropriately lives in the city. So Barbara asks, and I approve, if you could do this, it would make a big difference. Uh, the other thing we would like to see is as the city is rewriting its emergency plan that CERT's role is documented in that plan and we are talking to the city about that and then citizens have asked us for recommendation of where do I get this where do I get that we are very hesitant to recommend one supplier over another but what Lake Oswego is doing in fact this week Charlie and Wednesday, is that they have combined it with kind of a public works day where they brought out all the trucks. I think it's to attract the boys in the children and men alike so they could climb all over the trucks and then they have vendors there with preparedness. So um, Sherilyn's given us the head uh, okay to start conversations to see if we could do that here in Tualatin next year. Um, but that would be very helpful because residents really want it. So we're proud of our team. We um, have multi-year objectives to keep our four field exercises. We have one coming up this Saturday. Uh, we wanna lead the community in preparedness. We appreciate your support. And the, the Tualatin Ready workbook's gonna be updated for structural review. So that, that's a, an ad that'll happen and we'll give you a copy of that when it's done. Again, our goal is a resilient community. If Puerto Rico is an example of a non-resilient community. There is an economic loss that will never be recovered if a community cannot recover, and recovery is what we're all about. So thank you for your time. I'll take any questions you have. You wanna to go to the thank you page? <laughs> questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you. This, the work that you've done is just amazing. I am so impressed and so grateful for the hours and hours that everybody's put in. Um, I have a question about like the schools. Are you guys, do you coordinate like with the school districts about like what their policy is in the event of a catastrophe? Because we have so many really large yeah, schools. Yeah, this uh, Tual Tiger Tualatin School District three years ago didn't really have an emergency plan in place for their schools. And they advised us, and we agreed, that if schools were in, that we would not use that as a gathering spot. However, in the last year, we have engaged in conversations with individual principals, and we think that's going to be changing. So what they were first afraid of is that we would show up when they had 600 kids and get in the way, which is generally why first responders are worried. And we train not to be in the way. Right, Charlie? Yep. yep. We train to keep ourselves out of trouble. Right, Robert? Yes. <laughs> we do not want to be someone that needs to be rescued. Right. So as we engage in the communication with the principals, I th and I think the school district, I think that we will be in a a little different spot for one reason we have four uh, school district employees on our team okay. and one of them is responsible for the emergency response for his school so we just have a lot of communications to go on um, if school is not in then the schools are where 
we gather. Okay. Yeah, because I think about that because of the there's so many bridges between a lot of the neighborhoods and their children's schools, and if it is that type of catastrophe, you know, at least in East Tualatin, yes. as Charlie says, we will be an island. And we will be an island. Although I read, I, I read with thrill in my heart that there's a, uh, a plan to improve 206, or 205, excuse me, uh, the 205 um, structure because there's a okay. bunch of failures on all, on all of 205 and on I-5, so we don't know. But on, on, the, on the website, uh, Brian has designated the two locations for where we gather. One of them is is the school, is the primary, but if school is in session, there is another. So for East Walton, it's the school, the elementary school, mm -hmm. and then if they're in session, then we go to Afawadi or Afawadi or... Our in these days, I'll learn to pronounce that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what the, the uh, mobilization instructions we have from the city is that we're not mobilized until the city tells us. We can, however, help in our neighborhoods. And it's all the modeling I've seen, it could take several days for city government to get up. So the last thing they want us doing is 300 of us, oh, I dream of 300, <laughs> or even 127 of us showing up at the operations center saying, tell us what to do. So we're working out that communication so we, we don't show up the other nightmare we want to avoid is having our residents not to know where to go. And by having these communication hubs in the neighborhood, it's less dangerous to go a short distance than a long distance. So we want to be there so that we can give them real information and we will be connected with the city and they, they are our source of information. Not Facebook, nothing else. The city is our source. Yes? Maria? Councilwoman. Do you train, um, do you train on um, man-made disasters? It's on our list. Uh, we're, we're, there, unfortunately, the news gives us all kinds of things to think about. And yes, uh, railroad explosions, terrorism, um, arson, yes. And we, the reason we train on those things is like the weather. They, they are not on a geological time frame. They could happen at any time, anywhere. Charlie, yeah. Okay. yeah, so it's, and, and the rule, rule number one insert is safety for yourself and safety for those that are around you. So in those situations, if it's a, you know, if, if there's a, a fire or something like that, we would serve after being called up by the city. The the city and the county have lots of people that are that are far that are trained far more than we are in dealing with whether it's a hazmat problem or a fire or something like that. And we can be in a support role to the community there, but as far as dealing with that type of a that type of a disaster, that's, that's professional. Our instruction on terrorism is to stay at our house and don't go outside. That's our training on that. We're, we're not expect, we are not first responders. What we are is community volunteers intended to help recovery and to help people who are in shock and give first aid and correct information, <laughs> not crisis creators. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Um, first, uh, I'm tremendously proud to be a part of your team, uh, and I want to commend each of you and everybody that's part of the organization. You've uh, produced volunteers of the year, group volunteers of the year, but you haven't rested on your laurels. You continue to expand your mission, uh, your membership, and so thank you. And that goes to each of you and every member of CERT. Uh, second, I want to encourage anybody who's listening or out in the crowd. Millions watching this indeed, show. And, and, and I hope every one of them either becomes a CERT volunteer and goes through the program. There's wonderful things to learn, first aid, search and rescue. And it's not particularly onerous. It's seven classes right over, and they're in the evening, so everybody can fit it in their schedule. 
Uh, and if you can't do the CERT volunteer or you want to do something additional, the ham radio, um, you're not going to know how valuable that is until it's the only way you can communicate with anybody else in the world. Right. Uh, and then it's going to be invaluable. Right. Uh, the third thing, and this is uh, kind of breaches off of that, is that the unfortunate part about this is that nobody's going to know the incredible value that you've created until there's a real disaster. Um, but I don't want that to be a deterrent to anyone because, you know, as you mentioned, this, this giant Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, it could happen tomorrow. And, and I don't say that to, to scare anyone, but, you know, the geologic record, if I remember correctly, shows every 250 years roughly. Right. And we're about 50 years beyond the last yeah. big occurrence. Um, so just keep that on. <laughs> Although but, Scott Burns would tell you that it could be as much as 400 years. You know, being a geologist, he would, you know, at any rate. So, so while that, you know, gives me concern, I sleep better at night knowing the work that you're doing out there and, and the Thanks. number of volunteers that, that are being prepared. Uh, finally, I wanted to address your, your comment about the budget. I unequivocally support the additional money, and I don't think anyone up here is, is going to oppose it either. $3,000 or something I'm certain we can find, uh, especially in the context of the great work you're doing. So thank you. Well, thank you. That makes me sleep better because I, I sweat the pennies, guys. Paul? Any other questions? Paul? Oh, yeah. yeah, first off, Catherine, thank you very much for all the time you've put in. You've, I mean, I've got involved with you three years ago, and unfortunately I've not been able to take those classes yet due to a, an amazing sports schedule of some kids who like to play ball, but it's on my list of things to do. But I know I'm in good hands with your group and, and with all the volunteers that that you've put together. The one correction I want to make to your presentation, mm. and I do disagree with, I'll disagree with the geologist, having grown up in Southern California for 45 years and survived four major earthquakes, and in Southern California, they basically have forgotten what an earthquake is like. They haven't had a major one now in over 20 years, which is bordering on one of the longest stretches they've had in a long time. We're bordering here on one of the longest stretches that um, history knows of a major event. And so I would qualify that with we just don't know and, and be prepared any day at any time that this is going to happen. And, and as Councillor Kellogg said, it's unfortunate. Well, those of us who, or at least myself, we know the work you're doing and we can appreciate it now. Um, and others will appreciate it down the road if, if and when that time comes. But thank you very much for all that you've done. Well, I'm the spokesperson, but... This really is a team effort. There, uh, my job sometimes is just trying to keep up with all the other people and trying to document what in the heck we're up to because there's a lot of autonomy. Yep. Okay, the last few comments I have is, um, one, I'm going to get that map your neighborhood, or what's it called again now? <laughs> it's now 12 and ready. ready. Uh, we've had some new neighbors move in, so I'm going to bring it Great. up again. Where we talk about it is that national night out. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, like Paul, I got kind of distracted this last few years <laughs> being on city council, but I do promise to do my block, and I will be talking about it this summer with my uh, neighbors. And the second thing is, I just want to thank again, thank everyone said it before, thank you all for everything you do. I had the opportunity to go to one of your annual meetings a little while ago. I was just amazed in the amount of people in operations, the enthusiasm, the questions, the training. Um, and then the guys in the back tinkering with the, you know, the ham radio to get them ready <laughs> with the new ones. But and the, the teamwork that's there and the coordination is terrific. And just thanks for everything you do. Well, you know, ideally, we won't ever need your services. But as Councilor Kellogg says, maybe one day we will and we, we're going to need you here. Well, I'm kind of hoping that we get everything. Well, we're in the spot now where we're trying to uh, build a continuity and make sure there's people following us that could step into these roles that our relationship with the city is documented in a, and and it stays as good as it is now and that we just keep getting better and better so that if when it does happen and when is the right that we will be like that street in nebraska where it was a disaster but everybody is okay mm -hmm. it doesn't change that it was a disaster but People are not paralyzed, right. and that'll be economic recovery, and that's okay. what we're for. All right. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Bridget, did you? Sure. I wanted to say thank you as well, and especially raising awareness and um, bringing community together is a really important thing to me too, and I know we have that share that value. And I also um, um, 
work on the water consortium. So I also wanted to put this pitch out. We were talking about um, they have a um, being prepared for having 14 gallons of water and t taking a picture. So I think there was some kind of coordinating around the two, uh, our group and um, the city council, because I would like to be able to do um, a photograph with all of us with our prepared water in case of an emergency and be able to post it um, in link with the consortium and with CERT. And I just think that every time we can do those, um, those thought processes together, it really helps build momentum, yeah, yeah, here and outside of our city. So thank you again. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for the extra money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. Well, assuming operations agrees, we still have them. All right. So let's see. So now we're moving on to item F1, a public hearing. Uh, consideration of resolution number 5432-19. Adopting findings in support of a contract exemption and authorizing the city manager to conduct a request for proposal process to select a construction manager slash general contractor for the Tualatin Service Center project. Uh, this will be led by Tanya. Yeah. Good evening again. Um, Tanya Williams, Deputy City Manager. Um, we're here this evening um, to bring before you a resolution um, that um, is for the Tolton Service Center project. So you'll recall earlier this year we talked about the project that to construct a new building at our, our public works facility um, that will consolidate a number of city um, functions um, including our community development, public works, and operations um, teams all into one building. Um, you'll remember that we um, had an item before you earlier this year also to hire a project manager, owner's rep. Um, so we have that team with us here tonight, uh, members from our Plan B consultancy. Um, and they'll be walking through um, a proposal to use the CMGC process for the construction management side of the project. So. Um, they have a little bit of, presenta of a presentation to walk you through what that looks like. And if you guys want to introduce yourselves yes, too. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, my name is Gerard Mulroney. Um, I'm project lead uh, with Plan B Consultancy. This is my colleague, Jordan Henderson. Jordan Henderson with Plan B. Um, nice to meet you, finally. Um, good evening. Uh, we've probably got a presentation that's going to take me about five minutes um, just to run you through some things that Tanya has already mentioned. So. Um, we're here to basically talk through the uh, CMGC uh, procurement route um, and why we think it's a preferred option for this particular project. And um, we'll give you the pros and cons, um, pros of using this route versus the cons of using uh, the traditional um, procurement route under state law. Um, very quick introduction. Some of you may well be aware of who Plan B are. Um, I'm not trying to pitch us or sell us here at all, but a uh, company was formed back in 2006. We're based out of Lake Oswego, um, and obviously from my accent, you can tell I'm not from around here. Um, originally from Ireland, um, been with the company five years. Jordan's just been with the company over three. Uh, we're a cost consultancy uh, firm. Um, you can see on the list uh, the numerous public and private entities that we work for. Uh, we also provide project management and owner's rep services. Um, so why an exemption? Um, this particular project that we're involved with, um, there's two main uh, factors that we think on a daily basis. One is the budget, uh, it's quite a tight budget, um, and the second is the tight timescales that we have to complete this project, which is fall of next year. Um, the traditional procurement route, um, which is design, bid, build, uh, takes a lot longer. Um, it doesn't give you a cost certainty. Um, as you can see from the uh, tentative schedule that we show, um, it pushes out our construction timeline well into 2021, um, and none of these boxes tick the preferred route for this particular project. Uh, CMGC, it's been around quite a long time, longer than I have um, in one form or another. Um, we use this uh, procurement route on um, several of our projects. Um, a lot of our other clients as well have um, adopted it. It's very successful. Um, the highlights that it, it gives you is um, cost certainty up front. Um, we bring a general contractor on um, just after we appoint an architect. Um, they work 
collaboratively, which doesn't always happen with the, um, the previous route. Um, and at various stages along the process, uh, you have both the schedule and a cost health check, um, which helps our job immensely, um, that we can say to you guys and to Clay um, and our other representatives here this evening that both our schedule and our cost um, is on par with what you expect. Um, I was going to go on to the next one. Sorry, I'm talking really fast here, Irish accent, so uh, please jump in with questions at any point that you have. Um, another benefit is uh, the timeline that we've adopted here. Um, you can see that uh, right now we're in April, obviously. Um, we're moving through the architect selection process. Uh, we'll be starting our design phases quite soon. Um, but most importantly, uh, our construction timeline indicates that we'll hit our target of fall of next year using this particular uh, procurement route. Uh, the findings and the exemption, um, we kind of touched on these earlier. Cost savings, um, time savings, greater cost certainty up front, which is uh, very key given our tight um, budget, but also more importantly that this particular route doesn't favour um, any particular contractor. They still have to go through a whole process where um, the bidding has to go to three or more subcontractors. Uh, we scrutinise those along with the architect and the rest of the design team. So um, there's lots of catches and caveats and nets to make sure that um, it's all transparent and value for money. Um, and last slide is uh, obviously we're here for your approval to proceed to the next stage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the middle of uh, negotiating the architect contract uh, with approval in the next two weeks. Hopefully we send out the RFP for the general contractor GMC route, which can take two or three weeks as well. Okay. So thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to ask anyone from the audience who would like to speak on this item. Uh, either in favor or against it to come forward. Okay. <laughs> uh, Councillor questions? No. Comments? Councillor Kellogg? Yeah, just have a question. So the traditional model, the design, build, bid, bid, bid. Yep. yeah. Um, if that's, if that's just on a cost basis, right? So whoever comes in the lowest by law gets the contract, right? Uh, generally, that's the way it goes. but. You never have the cost current and see if they're going to be lowest or not until you actually bid it. That's uh, one of the, the main challenges with that particular uh, procurement route. Okay, so this this different model does more criteria than just cost. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, schedule as well is key. Okay, and so do you generally find that the cost is a little bit more than it would be for... I mean, obviously the savings are elsewhere in the process, but in terms of the cost for the, the, the contractor construction manager, is that not, generally Not higher? necessarily. We actually find that it's less um, when we go through this process. Um, as opposed to waiting to the end until it's bid competitively, then we hit a snag where if it is over budget, we spend six weeks, eight weeks going through a value engineering exercise. That blows our uh, timeline out of the water as well. Um, over the stages of the CMGC route, we have lots of health checks on the number. If we know we're over budget, we stop, correct it until we're under budget, and then move forward to the next step. Okay. And we don't do that with the traditional route. Just to clarify, the construction schedule for this project, if we go with this route, it's expected to be done fall of next year. Yes. And that's move-in ready? Yes. Oh, complete. Substantial right. completion and then a move-in period, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? A uh, question I asked Sherilyn when we, I had my call was, I believe this is the process we used for the Twalton Library when we did the expansion and it's the same model? Did you guys do that one too, or is it a different not. firm? Different firm? Different okay. firm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. How did that one work out for you? <laughs> yeah, you weren't here yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the country, but not All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? Just need a motion. If it varies, uh, okay with it. Motion to adopt resolution number 5432 19. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 5432-19. Any discussions on the motion? This is not a roll call. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It passes. Thank right. you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you in the next update. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next item, we now move into general business, item G1.
uh, consideration of recommendations from the Council Committee on Advisory Appointments. Debbie, right. Joelle, I don't have a presentation. Or <laughs> I don't have a presentation. Um, oh, we usually just read, we, just read a name. Right. So, we'll um, uh, just uh, let you know the Council Committee on Advisory Appointments um, exists to um, interview um, uh, potential um, members of council of uh, council committees as well as existing members to talk to people about how the process is currently working and make sure that we're listening to um, our citizens about making sure that things are running smoothly on our committees um, and choosing people who are best suited for these roles so um, with that said um, the uh, we are recommending the appointment of the following people uh, uh, Kristen Sacco for the Parks Advisory Committee, Anthony Warren for the Parks Advisory Committee, Buck Braden for the Arts Advisory Committee, Mahathi Sridhar for the Arts Advisory Committee, Don Upton for the Arts Advisory Committee, Kathleen Silloway for the Arts Advisory Committee, and Valerie Pratt for the Twelton Budget Committee. All right. Uh, any questions for the committee? Um, I don't know that we have any. I don't see any. Anybody? No. Anybody? No. 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 Um, Where's Buck? You know, Come I on, just Buck. I want to thank yeah. everyone that has applied for these positions um, and that has served on our committees over the years. Um, the volunteer hours that they put in are absolutely vital to the processes of this city, and um, I have served on this committee since I came onto council, and it has been wonderful to see the progression of folks um, through these committees and um, sometimes on the council position sometimes into other leadership positions within the city but the, at the core they are here because they love our community and it's a it's a great thing to see thank yeah. you especially something like everyone know buck braden has been the chair at walton arts yeah. forever uh don upton has been on the arts committee for quite a while valerie pratt pops up in numerous you know committees so we have some great volunteers in this city so do we just go ahead Bridget yep and, and with all the long timers we also have um, one or two younger student advisory committees as well um, just such a great variety of people so it's really a pleasure to serve on that committee and meet all the folks that are interested in being of service to the city of Tualatin yeah. Excellent. all right so do we vote on this or just approve it or okay Sure. Okay. Can I? Yeah. Can I make a motion? Yeah. A motion to accept the recommendations of the Council Committee on Citizen on Advisory Appointments, the CACA. Yes. CACA I second it. Committee. Right. I have a motion and a second to approve the, uh, uh, the recommendations from the CACA. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The recommendations are accepted. All right. Item G2. So G2, consideration of ordinance number 1418-19 relating to the Basalt Creek concept plan amending to Alton Development Code chapters 4, 7, 9, 51, 63, and 75 and the Transportation System Plan, PTA 19-0001, amending figures 11 and 73-3 and amending maps 9-1, 9-2, 9-4, 9-5, 12-1, 13-1, 72-1, 72-2, 72-3, and 74-1, PMA 19-001. I think Sean's going to talk a bit. Just briefly, so on, as the council may recall, on April 8th, the last meeting, the council uh, considered the plan text amendment 19-0001 and plan map amendment 19-001. Uh, that was a public hearing that the council conducted. It, it, the council closed the public hearing, deliberated on that, and uh, approved those, those two uh, plan text and plan map amendments. The council then proceeded to consider ordinance number 1418-19, which would then adopt those uh, amendments. Um, it received uh, a, a majority vote on first and second reading, uh, but the motion to adopt was not a majority, or excuse me, a unanimous vote. Therefore, this is back before the council, excuse me, for a third reading uh, because of our charter requiring it to be on uh, read uh, on two separate meetings. All right. 
Does anyone have any questions for Sean about that? I do. Just real quick. Okay. What's the appropriate motion here? Is it motion to approve the resolution or for third reading so, of the ordinance? So first we have to do a third reading of the ordinance and then the, the subsequent uh, motion for an adoption. Okay. okay. Do I have a motion? Yeah. Move to uh, adopt, or sorry, for third reading of ordinance 1418-19. Second. second. Okay. I have a motion and a second for a third reading of ordinance number 1418-19. All those in favor say aye. Do we have to do roll call? Or you, is that no, no, you don't. And just to clarify, that's by title only. Yes. Yeah. Oh. So I don't have to read the whole ordinance. Yeah. Oh, I was uh, sneaky. That's what I need. <laughs> oh, yeah. I need to amend my motion. All right. <laughs> motion for third reading by title only. Second. I have a motion and a second to read by title only ordinance number 1418 19. So we vote on this and then we do the. the Correct. Roll call, roll call is for yeah. the just yeah. final adoption. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. No, good. Are those opposed? Nay. Okay. Anyone abstaining? Okay. The Or ayes have it. Ordinance number 1418-19, an ordinance relating to the Basalt Creek Concept Plan, amending Tualatin Development Code Chapters 4, 7, 9, 51, 63, and 75, and the Transportation System Plan, PTA 19-0001. Amending figures 11-1, 11-2, 11-3, 11-4, 11-5, 11-6, -11 and 73-3. And amending, map, amending maps 9-1, 9-2, 9-4, 9-5, 12-1, 13-1, 72-1, 72-2, 72-3, -72 and 74-1. Plan map amendment 19-0001. All right, so roll call. Councilor Kellogg. No. Another motion? Okay. So move for final adoption of ordinance 1418-19. Second. I have a motion and a second for final approval of ordinance 1418-19. So I have a roll call. Sorry, what, Councilor, what? Discussion. Oh, discussion of the motion? I just briefly want to say I understand that there are people who are concerned about what's happening with Basalt Creek, and, and we've addressed those items at our last meeting. But I just want to reiterate, this is a concept plan. This is, this is moving things towards approval. The legislative process isn't done here. This is going to be a living part of the city, just like anything else, where zoning changes can happen. Uh, transportation infrastructure perhaps may not go where <laughs> some people intend for it to go. Uh, so this is not a point in time where we're stopping and saying it's going to look like this forever. It's just a step in the process. So I just want to make that comment. I also want to mention that um, feedback that we've been getting from residents uh, is always welcome and still can come in. They will be read and considered. Um, as you all know, you heard tonight, we will be on Washington County, like whatever you want to say, <laughs> whatever the term you want to use, I want to use the dirty one, <laughs> about getting things done right with storm water and making sure uh, park trails don't go where we don't want them to be. Um, so be certain that, you know, the city council will make sure uh, things go the way they want. We want them, not the way we're told they want, you know, cities or counties, other cities or counties want us to do it. We're going to do it the way we want it, and we'll make sure our residents are heard. Okay, so. Read the whole thing. <laughs> you have to read the whole thing now. Now it's just roll call. Oh. Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Reyes, sorry. Yes. Yes. Aye. Council Morrison? Yes. Councilor Brooks? Nay. City Council President? Nay. Nay. And the mayor votes aye, so I have five to two. All right, so the ordinance passes. All right. Oh, yeah, I get to use this, don't I? Well, actually, my laptop just did. My laptop just did it. Yeah. yeah. That's it. All right. Um, we have a holdover item from uh, work session, a request for moms demanding action, a proclamation. I believe I was emailed and Councilor Davis, but I'll let Councilor Davis run with it. Um, the uh, moms demand action group approached us about um, adopting this proclamation um, at our next meeting in preparation for um, National Gun Violence Awareness Week, I believe. And... Uh, Oh, shoot. Now, of course, I, I can't get it when I need to get it. Um, in order to, uh, uh, for National Gun Violence Awareness Day, due to um, the, the 
hordes of gun violence that we have seen happen over the years in our country um, and even in our own community. Um, this is a, uh, a non-political um, uh, proclamation and I would encourage all of you to support um, having this be part of our next council meeting. It doesn't have to be on the next thing. We just approve that we... We're just approving yeah, this. Yeah, that when they want it, we have to get it on the agenda. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Since we got it on the agenda on the second reading, I think that is because it's the first... Oh, is it? Yeah. First oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought it was the... That's what it's I was fine. Like, oh, no problem. Yeah. Whenever it is that they need it, that's fine. So this would be to approve the... the to approve us yeah. doing the proclamation because right. this is our new process. Right. Yeah. Any questions? I mean, this is just a hand, but all those in favor of approving and, you know, going forward with the proclamation? Okay. Yeah, four. Yeah, got four. Yes. All right. Got six, I think. Six. Yep. Three. All right. So then we're now moving into communications from counselors. Uh, we did that. Do you want to do your thing? Um, well, does, does anybody have anything? We didn't do that. Okay, I'll leave you. I'll save you for okay. last. Okay. All right. So we're Councilor Kellogg. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, <laughs> last Saturday? <laughs> it's a blur. Yeah, it is. Uh, I attended uh, a forum held by the Stafford Hamlet about land conservation, uh, retaining some of the rural character out in the Stafford Basin as development marches towards them. Uh, I want to thank them for putting on that event. Uh, Representative Prusak was there, Commissioner Humbertson, uh, Councillor Williams, just a, a great group of people. We had a couple of hours of conversation that I think was uh, very productive. Uh, second, on Friday of last week, uh, I attended a seminar in Gresham with Jonathan Edwards and Aquila on opportunity zones uh, and very granular details on how those work, what opportunities are available to cities. We also learned about a platform where we're going to be able to put potential projects up for um, review and sort of a, a delivery mechanism to investors all over the country. So uh, as we talk about opportunity zones, urban renewal districts, Walton 2040, uh, opportunity zones I think is going to play a big part in building projects that might, uh, but for opportunity zones, might not otherwise get built. Uh, and they can make a tremendous impact not only on the economics of our community, but because they're in low income census tracts, uh, also improve uh, the status of everybody in those neighborhoods if done appropriately. Uh, finally, I wanted to remind people that Thursday night, there is a, this Thursday night, Southwest Corridor Community Meeting. Uh, that's uh, from 6 to 7.30 at the Pack Trust Building, 16505 Southwest 72nd Avenue. Uh, we are approaching a decision point on the Bonita to Bridgeport segment uh, of the train. Um, as we have talked about at our last council meeting, there are some issues outstanding uh, before I think the city of Tualatin wants to sign off on this. And so uh, we'll be having those discussions um, at this community meeting. So I encourage you and anyone out in the community to come uh, and have your voice heard. Six to 7.30 on Thursday night. That's all I got. Thank you. That's Um, nothing. All right. Councilor Grimes. Nothing. Councilor Morrison. Yeah, I have a couple of things. I'll try to be quick here. First off, this Saturday from 9 to 5, Tualatin High School is doing, uh, the, ac the um, Athletic Booster Club is doing their drive for cash. It's not a sales event. You test drive a brand new Lincoln or Ford. It'll, um, it's about a five minute test drive. And um, Lincoln, uh, Landmark Ford, actually it's the Ford dealer, the Ford and Lincoln end up donating money to the school. Last year they raised $8,000. Um, that's the goal again this year. Again, it's really quick. You show up, um, test drive a brand new car down Day Road and around the loop and come back and um, the school collects money. So that's 9 to 5 this Saturday. Second off, I need clarification this Thursday. Byram CIO and Midwest CIO are both meeting. I have a time of 6 p.m. for Midwest, 6.30 for Byram, but the reader board at Twalton High School says the Byram CIO meeting is at 7 o'clock. So excuse me, perhaps we can get some clarification on that. I am, pl I am going to miss the open, I've been to a lot of open houses on the Southwest Corridor. I'm going to try to touch base with the CIOs. Um, it, 6.30, okay. So they moved it, okay. Because it was on your calendar that you sent us at 6.30, but just any, no words, I don't want to waste any more time. Second up, 
um, update on the, I got a notice that there's an open house on the Garden Corner Curve update on June 2nd, which is a Sunday. I thought that was kind of strange, and I meant to ask you about that last Friday. Gar Garden Corner Curves update, uh, they're closing the street down. Are they doing it on a Sunday? It's, it, the, the date that I got was June 2nd, which is a Sunday. I wanted to make sure, clarify that, because usually we do those on a Saturday, and Sunday's fine. I have no problem with it. I just wanted to make sure I had that date correct. Thank you. And then um, finally, uh, there is a list of 15 corridors that the Clackamas County Courting Committee has submitted. Washington County, apparently an emergency meeting, without going through a lot of people, issued 15. I <coughs> trying to get a hold of both lists. Uh, did you send me the Washington County list yet? Yes. You did. Okay. Then I have. I just I've been busy. And the reason is, is the next meeting is this Wednesday. Several uh, committee members have said they don't really want anyone talking, preaching for any one route this Wednesday because the, basically they believe the formality is going to be to take the 76 corridors that are on the list and bring it down to the 45, 15 from Clackamas County, Washington County, Multnomah County. There's multiple, several lists have the same routes. One of the routes that's very interesting that I will be speaking on at the May meeting is the West Corridor has made two different cuts, ironically from Clackamas County, of which West doesn't really run, has not yet made the Washington County list. I'd love to see that move over and get on both lists, Mayor. Um, and um, if you have a favorite, if you have things you want to say that the meeting is at the Metro um, Council building, it's the 2020 Transportation Committee, um, and they meet on the third Wednesday of every month. And there's one this Wednesday. Um, the one in May is when they're really looking for public input on the preferred routes. Eventually, it'll only be about eight corridors, so it's going to get kind of tight. And that's all the comments I have. Council Brooks. I want to say happy holidays and happy Earth Day. Um, I went to the Arts Committee meeting this past between last meeting and now. And one thing I wanted to bring up was the Viva Tualatin will be September 14th. There will be a call. There is a call for artists. Um, I'm not sure if it's quite on the web yet, but um, it is for a participatory art project. And we have openings for adult or even students if they would like to do a participatory art project, which would be a large art project at Viva Tualatin where participants would also participate in co-creating the project, so a community type thing. If that sounds interesting to you, if you're an artist out there or in here, um, look for the submission on the website. And I also wanted to mention that I too was at the um, Farmland and Open Space Forum, which um, Councillor Kellogg was on the panel. And so I appreciated him being there. Um, I attended um, and learned a lot about, one of the things I learned about was the fact that we have soil in this area that's the best soil in the whole world. I don't know if people realize that or not. And there's ways, um, there's concerns because we're losing it quickly and there are ways to preserve it. So if um, there's a lot of information from from that that's really interesting. Um, and then finally, what else? I was at the State of the County, and I'll let our mayor talk more about that, but I appreciate his, um, you know, introducing me around and being very friendly. <laughs> um, and it's great to see, you know, and hear our new um, county commissioner uh, leading in a way that has all the county there that we can introduce. So it's a different kind of a way that they're doing it, um, just like we're doing some things differently here too. And then finally, I wanted to propose um, to consider for a work session um, Tualatin becoming a certified B city. We, I have talked about it with um, Ross and did a little preliminary research. There's still more to do, but um, sustainability in our parks is number three on our master plan list of things to do. 
There are five things that we need to do to be a certified B city. And we have, I think, four or five of them. One of them is um, an integrated pest management plan, which um, I have concerns, not just for the bees, but for the human beings around ties to uh, glyphosates and, or glyphosates and um, the studies have been coming out more and more and the um, ties to cancer, um, especially lymphomas. Um, and so if anybody has any questions about that, and I don't know, is that, I've, this is my first time doing this, so from what I understand, I need four people to support that idea. You plus three. Me plus, <laughs> well, I count as a person. Yes. So, um, three more. Yeah. So. so I'm putting that out there, and that's all my things. Thanks. Sounds, yeah. All right. yep. All well, let me just, so I provide a little clarification from a staff perspective of what that direction look means mm -hmm. is that you are giving us direction to, um, we would, we would go do some research and bring a, a work session item about what it, what it would take to be, be a B city and right. be certified and mm -hmm. like all, all of that at some point in the future, hopefully yeah. the not too distant mm -hmm. future, but. Okay, yep. perfect. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, I'm going to go next. So Council President Davis can go last. Um, yeah, Westland's pretty, pretty proud of being a B-City, so we got to be a B-City too. Um, <laughs> talk to uh, Ross Hoover, and there's, uh, there's only a couple uh, steps left. Because that ties into, I was at the uh, tree planting this last Saturday. Um, where Friends of Trees organized 200 volunteers. We're at the park. Uh, we planted 1,800 uh, plants, bushes, and pollinating uh, plants. So a lot of those plants that went into the uh, pollinating area of the uh, community garden, community garden, community park, will help out with the uh, B City certification. Uh, I want to thank PGE. Uh, they were there in forest. Maria Pope, you know, the CEO of PG, was there wheelbarrows going by me. You know, she was planting things like crazy. Uh, I helped plant the tree that's over here next to the pole center with the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. I give credit to the Boy Scouts trying to run a bunch of Cub Scouts is unbelievable. <laughs> Talk about a, a herd of cats and trying to get them to do something, but you know, it was shovels and dirt and they got their hands dirty, so they're having a lot of fun doing that. I also want to thank the Lewis and Clark football team. We have uh, hopefully got some pictures. There used to be a huge tr uh, fallen tree over here in the creek and uh, Tom Steiger was telling me that he had to plan on maybe getting a crane to get it out there. They put the Lewis and Clark football team down there. These guys picked the freaking thing up and walked it out of the creek into the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, so they got their work out for the day. So I want to thank yeah, the Friends of Trees. Great turnout. Maria Pope was, Maria Pope was astonished how many people came. So was I. Uh, State of the County uh, was terrific. Uh, one thing we got to remember for uh, Wednesday is they had a lot of sound issues. Uh, I think one of the problems there was it was in a big gym slash auditorium, uh, very large space. We were trying to use wireless, and uh, they had to stop the state of the county for a while to figure out their audio issues. But it was well done. Uh, it was nice to see uh, all the uh, folks that represent us on the chair on the board uh, get to speak about what's going on in their districts. And then you never hear from the county judges or the county auditor, and that, let alone the DA. So they got all to speak, so that was nice. Um, Paul was mentioning I was at a Washington County Mayor's Emergency Corridor meeting last week or so. Again, a blur. We trimmed the list down to eight, uh, the eight top corridors from our list for Washington County. Uh, I fought strongly for Twelfth and Sherwood Road, which was on the list of the eight, and uh, King City. And uh, myself and Tiger fought to get 99W out of the secondary list up to the primary list, and that caused 26 to go down. Uh, so we have two major corridors in our area. They're in the top eight we're re uh, recommending to Metro to look at. The way it was pitched to us was that Metro was probably going to look at three corridors per county. And what they're going to try to do is find out those corridors uh, that would resonate the best with voters. And for 2020, um, and you know, basically have to do the do the math and figure out most impact, most money, and where can they get the votes. Um, it, it's not going to be 
which corridor is more, you know, clogged than another. It's going to be basically, you know, who, you know, most impact and most people get the most votes. And uh, I think the city council president of Sher uh, Sherwood would put it the best that, you know, if Tualatin Sherwood Road and 99 W aren't addressed, you might lose a lot of votes here in the Southwest County. <laughs> so Metro might want to look at that very hard. Uh, last thing I have is I had a terrific call with Lynn Peterson uh, to discuss the TriMet proposal about the accurate crossing at Carmen and Upper Boone's Ferry. Uh, Lynn Peterson is a delight to talk to on the phone. She's very candid. <laughs> um, she is totally in favor of what we want, as, you know, with the raised uh, crossing. Uh, back, you know, she worked with ODOT years ago. She thinks it's kind of stupid to have it at grade. Uh, she will advocate along with us for the 50 million because um, one of the projects that was on those 15 or so corridors uh, that Washington County Mayors looked at was out at 185th. They're having issues with an accurate crossing with the TriMet Metro with, with light rail. And they're looking for $40 million to fix their, to put a bridge there. So as uh, Mayor Callaway put it, don't they ever learn? Do it now. It's cheaper to do it now. So, um, uh, Build it right the first time. So yeah, the uh, emergency meeting was really good. Uh, Chernel was there along with Garrett. And it was, I thought, a good meeting. Uh, all the cities worked collaboratively to come up with a list of eight. Uh, it wasn't all, you know, take my, I'm going to take my stuff and go home because you didn't, you know, vote for my project. Everybody was working together. And uh, we have Lynn Peterson in our corner, to, you know, take on ODOT and uh, TriMet to get the funding that we need to have a raised crossing because we all know that at grade isn't going to work. Councillor Davis. Um, so tomorrow I'll be participating on a pre-trip call for the upcoming DC trip um, for next week where we will be going to ask for money for that among a bunch of other things. Um, but the main reason I wanted to go last today is because I have to do something tonight that I was hoping I would never have to do at, at, at this point is um, announce my resignation from council effective after the next meeting. I have taken a job in Seattle and we are going to be moving and it's terrifying. <laughs> I've been in this community for 19 years and it has meant everything to me and uh, it's been an absolute honor to serve with all of you and um, I appreciate all of the time and energy and effort and the back and forth and the fighting and all the good stuff too. I love every minute of it. That's all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we, we won't have the weepies yet. We'll wait till the last minute until we all start crying. But <laughs> you still got more work to do. You got to go to DC. <laughs> and I get, you know, I got I to put it all out there. There you go. Nothing to lose. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get to just, I get to roll over <laughs> for all those old men yeah. and just lay it all out there. It's going to be right. awesome. All right. <laughs> Oh, great. All right. Uh, any other communications? Do I have a motion to adjourn so we can move on to the next thing? Adjourn. All right. So I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Any discussion on the motion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nah. All right. Okay. So you want to take a little break and then we'll get into the. How do you want to do it, Tanya?